What's up YouTube, it's your boy The Old Dragon Geek again, and today I'm gonna review Ready Player One. So, uh, this I don't wanna say is Spielberg's at his best, but it is Spielberg as a return to form as far as like these big blockbuster movies are concerned. Uh, these big crowd pleasing movies, and personally, I dug it man, I thought the movie was fucking off the chain. Off the chiss ain't at that. Um, yeah, Spielberg does a good job of not making any kind of rookie mistakes when it comes to the world. Uh, he paints a vivid picture of the world, uh, de developing its history, uh, how it works. Uh, and, you know, it's very easy to input characters in there once uh, you know how this world works. And that was ah, beautiful, tasty pasta. I swear to God. Something to point out is that this movie had beautiful, beautiful pacing. Again, Spielberg doing a Spielberg thing and not having any rookie mistakes. I have you confused or wondering or losing interest early on. All, the whole movie, but especially earlier on, the pacing is really well and it keeps you intrigued, intrigued enough until it just becomes a spectacle. Like, until the spectacle comes and just sucks you in completely into the movie. And you are sucked into the movie. You go into this world of the oasis that he creates. Also, the world of the Oasis's world. You know, um, the world of 2045. He explains it and, you know, how it got that way, more or less, lightly brushes over how it got that way and why, how, people, how people's mentality is at this point in history. So, um, with that being, like, stated, and then, you know, the Oasis being introduced, you're, you go into the Oasis, man, and just, like, the visuals. There are a few directors that could just shoot some of these scenes as cinematically as Spielberg can. I mean, you know, he's an OG. What are you gonna say about Spielberg? He's an OG. And um, yeah. This movie is basically about a futuristic world, uh, a dystopic futuristic world in which everybody plays video games and intense VR games or uh, virtual reality games. Everybody is in this one world called the Oasis. I mean, they live in the regular world too. And um, you know, very like, poor world like for it being the year 2045 which is uh the year that this takes place in they're living in a very poor world and their escape is um the oasis and everybody's plugged in you also have um giant companies that are kind of in a way trying to take over the oasis uh for business reasons and such and um so you have the creator of the oasis uh, a gentleman who just died uh five years before this movie takes place he was the creator, kind of like the architect in the Matrix, and he left some Easter eggs. He left a Easter egg, one Easter egg, and whoever gets it is gonna like basically run the Oasis. And that's pretty much the rundown for the whole movie. Uh, you meet the heroes, and the heroes start unraveling it, and until they, you know, they're going for the Easter egg. And shit happens, I'm not gonna spoil it for you guys, but yeah. Another thing I wanted to say is that this movie is through and through a family movie. Uh, there's not much room for cynicism in this movie. Uh, even when things are getting serious and a little bit darker tones and serious things starts happening, the movie strikes a good balance in between not making it too dark and too, you know, like, oh my God, too heady. And at the same time, um, striking that balance to where you actually care what's happening to the characters and, you know, you feel that there's stakes, but it never gets too heavy. It's a family movie. And like I said... Not a whole lot of room for cynicism. Um, you could have had all kinds of crazy shit happen um, in the Oasis and in the world right outside the Oasis. But they don't go that route. They keep it family friendly and it's a good, 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 great, if I must say, family film. Not only is it just beautiful and cinematic and well directed and all that good shit. The references, dog, the Easter eggs, the pop culture references are just... Uh, like this, I, my brain couldn't contain it. There were fucking Iron Giants and Gundams and fucking um, battle fucking toads, fucking battle toads, um, uh, DC characters, Marvel characters, fucking Ninja Turtles, fucking Mario, anything in the 80s and 70s and 90s that you grew up idolizing or watching or even like casually glancing through, fucking Ryu, Chun Li. Back to point. <laughs> Anything you grew up, like, you know, watching and shit, like, a lot of it is here. You know, 
They didn't have no Mighty Max, you know, no, no Savage Dragon. They skimped out on the 90s a little bit, but it's okay. A point that was made by one of my buddies was that why the fuck is the year 2045 and everybody's obsessed with mostly 80s pop culture? Fucking DeLorean, the fucking Akira bike, dog fucking King Kong. All right, back to my point. Um, my buddy was saying why it's full of 80s stuff if it's 2045. And the reason for that is because, spoilers, the creator was obsessed with 80s pop culture, 70s and 80s pop culture. And since he's left all, you know, he left the Easter egg and everybody's on the hunt for the Easter egg. He's also left like a library of his life. So people go through his life to see shit about his personal life. And since people are obsessed with him, they in turn are obsessed with the 80s. So if you guys have watched the movie and you're wondering why you're just watching this with shits and gigs, or if you, you know, it's a light spoiler, I guess. Yo, Chris. You can put the spoiler right before the shit goes up, yeah. I'll try. Holla, holla, holla. Yeah. So, like I said, this movie was straight up pop culture, straight up nostalgia porn. And, but the movie is crafted in a way that it's also an adventure. And you go on this adventure and you feel like a kid. So, with the nostalgia and with the feeling of a kid, I've never had this happen to me before. Where I go into a movie... And I feel young and old at the same fucking time. It was a crazy feeling. It bugged me out. And to be honest, man, it made me like a huge fan of this movie. I might read the book, but you know, I'm kind of slightly ill writ, you know, so don't count on me reviewing this book anytime soon. As far as performance is concerned, uh, my favorite actor in this whole shit was Mark Rylance. He plays James Halliday. He is the creator of The Oasis. You see him uh, mostly in flashbacks, but he does get kind of an arc even in the flashbacks, if that makes any sense to you guys. Don't want to get into too much spoiler territory, so I'm just going to keep it at that. But his performance was super dope. I love, 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 love this performance. It was, um, at moments, it was very subdued, but um, he just played this very great, awkward, sympathetic character, and you just empathize with him so much. I can't say nothing much further than that. You guys gotta watch the movie for that, but yeah, that's probably my favorite performance in the whole movie. Also, Ben Mendelsohn, he plays uh, the character Sorrento in the movie. He's the villain. He was hit or miss for me, personally. Uh, there were moments where he does seem a little bit sinister, but he plays it mostly like a subdued comic relief of almost. And sometimes, you know, especially from what he does and stuff like that, he does seem a little bit menacing at times. Sometimes he overplays it and it kind of drags the movie down a bit but for the most part it was a plus i guess the actors ty sheridan and olivia cook are more or less the leads of the movie um they did a lot with the mocap they were pretty cool and i think they did just a fine job but to be honest they didn't knock it out of the ballpark like somebody else could perhaps um i just felt like it was something missing in their performances also um part of what makes you sympathetic to these characters are the fact that they seem like underdogs. So perhaps a good actor that's like slightly fugly would have done a little better in my opinion because like they were like both super good looking. And spoiler alert, Olivia Cook's character is supposed to be like scarred. She has like a birthmark on her eye. And it's like, you know, they're playing her like she's disgusting. But she's like, she saw a hot, very attractive young lady. All she has is like a little thing. And they're like, ah, oh, she's hideous. Like, I hate when movies does do that shit. Like, you know, one little thing. I'm like, all right, they're hideous. But you cast it like one of the most beautiful women ever. Not really. They're more beautiful women in Hollywood, in my opinion. I'm not ugly shaming. Oh, God. The PC police. <laughs> one of the slight gripes that I do have with the movie is the fact that the characters don't seem like they develop enough or that you get enough background on them in the beginning especially, and mostly the supporting characters. You do get some things about them, but they never really truly go too much in the depth into their personal histories. They brush over it lightly, and then that's it. Um, a lot of these side characters, uh, you can chalk the lack of development to the fact that, you know, like the anonymity, the anonymous nature of the Oasis. You can just be like, okay, Nobody really knows each other in the Oasis like that because everybody's just playing as their avatar. 
So, you know, uh, in a way it works, but in a way it's like, eh, not the greatest thing. One last little grievance that I did have with the movie is the fact that um, toward the end, again, spoiler alert, they drive home the idea that perhaps, you know, reality is real. So does it's more important than, um, you know, any kind of virtual game and any kind of virtual world. And, you know, that's all good. It's, you know, it has some messages. The movie has some message. But fuck, does the movie beat it into your face? Like, the movie has no kind of subtlety when it comes to the message. It just, like, slaps it in your face, like, over and over again. It, at one point, it almost felt, slightly almost felt, not quite, but it almost felt like the ending of um, Lord, of, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, where it had, like, 18 endings. At the end, I was like, we get the idea. This movie could have ended, like, three scenes earlier, but not quite as bad as Return of the King, though. That was one for the, that was one for the record books. Like I said before, this movie is high spectacle. It's a family film. Um, it could have had more debt, perhaps, but it's not that kind of film. And to me, it was magical enough and it was beautifully crafted enough that I give it five shots. It gets five shots in the ODG calendar, baby. That's how we do. So if you like this video, you can go ahead, like, share, subscribe, comment, all that bullshit. I know it's down here somewhere. And um, yeah, catch us on Instagram, dropping loads, old drunken geek. Um, catch you fuckers later.